Hey classes, welcome back. If you look at the board this week, we are in week 13. We are wrapping up, we have wrapped up the first trimester and we're plowing forward into the second trimester by bringing it all together, doing a little bit of chemistry, physics, a little bit of what we've seen all year, putting it into our Mars unit. So let's jump on in with the Mythbusters baseball episode behind us and how that does a pretty good job of bringing together some of the stuff that we've been talking about in here. Uh, yesterday, let's start with this. We started with a question on the board underneath the brain pop after we saw the intro. And it said, could you throw a curveball on the moon? And of course the answer was no, because when you are talking about what makes a baseball curve through the air, you're talking about the spinning of the baseball. Now I love everything about this unit when we start getting into the friction and all the ways of the forces of flight you know, affect, for example, the flight of a baseball, the flight of a golf ball, a volleyball. And in terms of a baseball, you're talking about the spin of the baseball, uh, creating an effect, the Magnus effect, which we'll get into in more detail tomorrow, but creating an effect where the ball will spin one direction or another, uh, or a sinker, or you get, uh, it's not truly a rising fastball, but you get a, a fastball that's got some backspin so it doesn't drop as much under gravity. The point is, friction was what the scientists talked to us about in class about a week ago when we had some guest speakers and friction comes up again and again it's one of our key terms again this week and if you're looking at our key terms this week uh, almost all of them are review key terms except for catalyst which we'll get to in a second and we're trying to show how these come together and one of my favorite ways to do it is this unit on mars we compare and contrast the two planets we talk a little bit about okay, why is there life here? But if you go to Mars, it's just a rusty rock in space. And to that end, we're reviewing Newton's laws, what it's gonna to take to get to Mars and get back. Uh, we're reviewing a little bit of the chemistry that we've learned so far, trying to bring it together into one cohesive unit about the engineering, the science, the math of getting to uh, our neighboring planet for exploration purposes. So with that, the Mythbusters here on this one, great review of the scientific method. This particular one, they were taking baseballs and putting them in a humidor. If you go to Colorado, Colorado is known as the Mile High City. It's very, very dry. And if you get up there, the baseballs tend to be drier because you're the high desert up there. The humidity in Colorado often hovers around, oh, 30% or so. And so it's a fairly dry place. The baseballs tend to dry out. Also, there's less air resistance up there. Uh, when you're talking about a baseball pitcher, they can't get as much curve on their curve balls. And uh, when you're talking about once the batter hits the ball, they can they can hit it uh, farther in Colorado because there's less air resistance once the uh, once it comes off the bat. All of this led to a huge increase compared to other stadiums of home runs hit in Coors Field up there. And so it turns out they put their baseballs down in a humidor. They keep them a little bit damp, a little bit humid, a little bit wet, and that brings down the number of home runs that are hit at that stadium. When you look at this Mythbusters episode, it's a great Mythbusters episode here, um, they take uh, the control variable. The control variables are using you know, standard out-of-the-box baseballs. They use the same bat, the same swing speed. This was what, what I was asking the students to figure out for themselves what are the control variables here. The weather, in this case, is a good control variable. The Mythbusters did this down in uh, San Jose on a day when there was virtually no wind and the launch angle of the baseballs in their field. The independent variable was the humidity in which the baseball was kept, whether low, regular, out of the box, or high humidity. And then the uh, dependent variable was how far the baseball went with each swing of the bat. And when they started getting their data, if this is a baseball diamond here, and they were hitting them, they noticed three distances on the baseball hits, and it was beautiful data. It was like a real world scatter plot here. They noticed that the ones that were kept in humid conditions, the baseballs that were kept in humid conditions didn't go as far. The standard out of the box baseball, in other words, the control humidity um, went about midway and the very, very dry baseballs went the farthest. Um, again, it was one of the nicest scatter plots that you'd ever want to see in terms of the data they got for this episode. It lent a lot of credence to the idea that humid baseballs do not travel as far as why Colorado keeps theirs in a humidor up there. So that was a review there 
of the scientific method. Again, we began the year talking about uh, control variables, independent variables, dependent variables. This part of the episode was a review of that. Uh, going over here, we're reviewing a little bit at the beginning of the class. Let me get them lined up if I can. I'll turn off the projector. Be right back. We're doing a little bit of the review of the class today on the chemistry that we've learned so far. The chemistry that we've learned so far had to do with catalytic converters, a catalyst. We've talked about proteins. We've talked about uh, amino acids, a catalyst. It's the new term this week. A catalyst is just a thing that helps a chemical reaction take place faster. You can kind of think of it like the dating app in the chemical world. You've got two chemicals that normally would take a very long time to react if they were going to react at all. But an enzyme, a catalyst, helps them get together and it will speed up a chemical reaction or, in the case of breaking down food that you've eaten, an enzyme might be there to break apart a couple chemicals. It's like the opposite of a dating app. I don't know if there's any opposite of dating apps out there, but it'd be like an app where you get two people together then break them apart. I don't know. Is that, is that a thing? I don't think that's a thing. But if you're looking at an enzyme, a catalyst, a real world example of this is a catalytic converter on a car. You've probably heard about catalytic converters before. For example, right here in Pacifica, unfortunately, there was uh, some people stealing some catalytic converters. The Pacifica police caught them. And what they had found is they had sawed off these catalysts, catalytic converters, that sit at the end of an exhaust pipe. What do they do? As the hot exhaust gases come through a traditional gas-powered car, a catalyst within this little tube, this little pipe, speed up a chemical reaction that takes some of the harmful gases out of the exhaust before it has a chance to go into our atmosphere. So if you hear the word catalyst, catalytic converters, it's a device that speeds up a chemical reaction, and in this case, it speeds up a chemical reaction with the purpose of taking pollution out of the atmosphere. When we get to the movie The Martian, we're gonna see uh, Matt Damon's character, Mark Watney, uh, use a iridium catalyst, it's just a way of making a chemical reaction again happen faster, to make one, water for his crops that he's gonna grow on Mars, and also as a byproduct, it does release some oxygen as well. So we're gonna see that in the movie when we get to The Martian, starting next week in week 14. Um, and the next part over here, get to the last board of the day. Oh, had to do with a little field trip that we took outside to see a chemical reaction in action. And it's rust. We live in Pacifica. It's a great place to check out rust. When you're looking at the salt that's floating around our air all the time out here, we have a lot of salt in our air from the waves crashing on the beach. You've got little salt particles resting and dropping all over the place. And it speeds up. It's not a true catalyst, but it does speed up the chemical reaction of oxidation or rust. When we look at our planet, we see a beautiful, from space, blue, green, white marble in space. We have oxygen, about 20% of our atmosphere is oxygen. It goes to one of yesterday's questions. You get about 20% of our atmosphere is oxygen. Where is most of that oxygen coming from? Well, three and a half billion years ago, we had the first photosynthesizing bacteria that were putting oxygen into our atmosphere. And the oxygen took a long time to build up. At first, a lot of the oxygen was getting taken up because of the chemical reaction we saw right outside our school. Every place that you get that has uh, any metal that's exposed that isn't painted, the metal's all brown and red and rusty. What's going on there? The oxygen is essentially sticking to, it's oxidizing, it's chemically reacting with the iron and it's causing the very familiar uh, chemical reaction, we know it as rust. If you leave your bike outside, it gets a little bit wet in the fog, and you come back a day or two later, you're gonna notice a lot more rust spots on it. And when you're talking about looking at the planet Mars, that's a rusty bike on a really, really big scale. You're talking about a planet, about a third the mass of the Earth, that has that reddish brownish color to it, because most of the oxygen on Mars is, is held up, it's, it's stuck to the iron that's in the crust. When you look at our planet, we have free oxygen, O2, in our atmosphere because you've got photosynthesis pouring out O2 constantly. We have O3 in the high atmosphere, that's called ozone. 
We have O2 in our atmosphere that, of course, we use in the process of respiration. One of the things that James Webb Space Telescope is looking for when it looks at the atmospheres of exoplanets, it's looking for free oxygen in the atmosphere. Oxygen tends not to last very long in the atmosphere. It tends to be very, very reactive. It is very reactive. And it tends to, if you will, chemically stick to things like iron. It ends up in rocks. When you look at some of the things that we'll see later on this year in geology, there's these layers of rocks that were laid down around the time photosynthesis was busy pumping out all the oxygen it could early, early in Earth's um, history. You've got a lot of that early oxygen getting stuck, if you will, to iron in the rocks, staying in a layer, and we can now look at those banded iron layers and have a really good idea of when the first photosynthesizing organisms emerged and how long it took for oxygen to build up in our atmosphere to make Earth such a magnificent place to live. All right, so that is kind of bringing together some of the physics that we've done, a little bit of the Newton's laws, a little bit of the friction, with some of the chemistry that we're looking at. And ideally, when we check out The Martian next week, starting in week 14, we're going to uh, catch, uh, not the entire movie, but some of the highlights. We're going to see how you bring together a little bit of the physics, a little bit of the chemistry, a little bit of the geology, and you get our beautiful green, blue, white planet out here in space that is just perfect for life. While Mars is kind of a rusty red rock that is only about a third of the size of Earth, uh, we might eventually, of course, have some places that are semi-permanent uh, places to explore the Martian surface with. But in terms of terraforming and making it a planet that would be habitable long term, that would take a tremendous amount of engineering, something far beyond what we can do right now. That's where I'll leave it today. Just uh, make sure you check out the key terms this week. Hope you're enjoying the little Mythbusters that we're checking out today. You can hardly ask for a better episode when it comes to talking about the physics of the things that we've seen so far, Newton's laws, friction, and the forces of flight, uh, combined with some of the chemistry that we've seen so far. So it's been a little bit of everything. Going into week 14, we'll see the Martians. So I'm looking forward to that. Take care.